excited. We're excited that you're here, Ty. Thanks so much. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Wanda, and everybody for inviting me to come back. Sure, you bet. Um, this is where I, I started my, my speech. My first speech was right over the chapel. Uh, and you go to my YouTube channel, it's still there. Um, real briefly, before I get into my topic, uh, you know, my name is Tyrone Griffin. Uh, I was in transition. I was out for 15 months. Um, since I abandoned my, my opportunity, I've been working out a little over a year, a year and a half now. Um, and what I've been doing is going out to different networking events and just give presentations. Primarily because one thing I learned in transition was that the, looking for a job is hard enough, but it's dealing with transition that really messes with you. You know, it's, it's you know, waking up two or three o'clock in the morning every day and dealing with it. So I've been doing a couple of things. One of the things is uh, these presentations. I uh, also do a podcast. It's called Bunny Slippers Are Evil because if it's three o'clock and you're out on your bunny slippers, you're not looking for a job. Go to the website, bunnyslippersareevil.com. Every Saturday at 10 o'clock, I do a podcast. Uh, this past week, I interviewed uh, Holly Crawford, who is a career coach. But I've been doing it for about two years. So there are approximately 100 shows out there on a variety of topics. They're all free. I also started this year uh, tweet jobs. You go to, uh, my handle is at Evil Bunny Man. But if you follow me on Twitter, uh, I subscribe to a lot of, uh, I follow a lot of other people. They tweet jobs, I retweet them. So um, that's one other way to find jobs. So those are primarily the other two things I'm doing besides working full time and you know, raising family. And um, so I'm, I'm busy. When I ask everybody, once you do land, give something back. Okay? You may not come back and do this. But help somebody. Try to help somebody in transition because you once you've been there, you see what it's like. It's hard, at least for me, it's hard to walk away from it and say, Well, I got mine. So you know, so the reason I do this and my podcast and Twitter and everything else is just for that reason. I'm filming tonight, not because I think I'm a great speaker, but because I don't see many other speakers targeting people in transition. So I'm hoping that by filming this and putting it out on, on my website and YouTube and it's all free, that you know there are people who came from Wichita. Atlanta has a really good job networking community. Some cities don't have it. They don't have anything. I've talked to people from around the country. Some of them don't have any. There's There are unemployed people, but there's no network. So everybody's pretty much out on their own. I mean, in Atlanta here, you can go to a meeting every day of the week. Believe me, Saturdays and Sundays included, you can go to a job networking meeting every day. So the reason I filmed this is that hopefully it can help somebody who may not be able to come out this meeting. If you think about it, there's still, I mean, how many unemployed people do we have in the Atlanta area? A couple hundred thousand at least. What happens is people, you, you get tired of coming. And there's nothing against the meeting, you just, it wears you down. You know, you come to a meeting every week or every other week, and after a while you get tired. You know, you don't see the progress you want, so you, it's easy to just shut it off and just say, well, I'll stay home tonight. So, on that note, tonight's topic, and what I'm talking about tonight are the seven keys to staying motivated while you're in transition. Zig Ziglar, who, was a, who just passed away recently, but he's a very well-known speaker. He had a good, I'll paraphrase what, something he said about uh, my motivation. He said, basically motivation, you know, people say, well, why do you have to motivate somebody every day? So motivation is kind of like bathing. You gotta do it. And if you don't do it every day, there's a problem. You have to do it every day. So every day you get up, you have to motivate yourself. So what I'm going to talk about are the seven things that I think you can do to help keep yourself motivated. And the first one, right up front, is address your fear. People are in transition, you're afraid. 
And, and, and understand this, transition is a microcosm of your life. Those things that, you know, if, when you were working and there were things you just ignored and you were fearful about, when you get in transition, they magnify. You know, every little fear, every little doubt about yourself. So fear is one of those things, the letters, F-E-A-R. Depends on how you look at it. Some people will say fear stands for forget everything and run. You know, there's a fight or flight. That's the flight part of it. Some people say fear stands for face everything and rise. That's the fight part of it. It all depends on how you look at it. You know, when I was doing research for this, for this presentation, there are tons of motivational quotes on fear. You know, think about that. You know, everybody is talking about fear, and they're talking about it from different ways. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from Yoda from Star Wars. By the way, I'm a Star Wars fan, so you might hear a few quotes from Star Wars here and there. But he said, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. If you've read the book Doom, which was written by Frank Herbert probably 30 or 40 years ago, he said, fear is the mind killer. And we all been there, where you're afraid of something. You know, maybe it's you hear a dog, you know, or, or, or anything, and you freeze up. You know, that's the worst thing to do, but that's what you do. You know, when we get afraid, we, we just stop. And that's normal. That's just a normal reaction to fear. Another quote: uh, Fear can keep us up all night, but faith makes a really nice pillow. So you can conquer fear with faith. So now the question I ask you is, what are you afraid of? You know, are you more afraid of not getting a job? Or, and I'll ask the, the mother in the room, what are you more afraid of? Not getting a job or not having your daughter proud of you? Think about that. You know, Looking for a job is one of the hardest things you can do, you know, when you don't find it and you keep looking. You know, the, the thing that makes people proud of their parents is how you deal with adversity, or your friends, how you deal with adversity. It's not that, you know, my mother or my father couldn't find a job. It's that they got up every day and kept looking. So you think about what are you more afraid of? You know, not getting a job or not having her able to look at you and say, "Mom, proud of you." you know, we might be living under a bridge or whatever, but Mom, you never gave up. That's worth so much when your when your family, your friends, whoever can look at you with, with, with pride in their eyes and say, "You know what? No matter what happened, you never gave up." And the fact is, you know, with fear, some days you're the bug. Some days you're the windshield. I say some days you're the bird, some days you're the statue. It's just the reality. But uh, John Wooden was an NCAA basketball coach. He said, do not let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. So don't be so afraid. <coughs> and you know, people get afraid of success sometimes. You know, we, we don't come out and say it, but sometimes people are afraid of succeeding. You know, what if you try this? What if what if it doesn't succeed? Well, what if it does? And, and we don't think about that when we're you know, I don't want to fail. I'm so, you know, it's that, that idea of playing. You see it in, in sports a lot. Teams play. They don't play to win. They play not to lose. You saw the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago. The Ravens. After, and it's interesting, there was that, that blackout. Before the blackout, the 49ers only scored six points. After the blackout, the Ravens only scored six points. The Ravens started playing not to lose, instead of playing to win. It's a big difference. And that's why the 49ers came back, because the Ravens started playing it safe. You know, I'm not going to, we're not going to go for the touchdown. We, let's go for a field goal. No, let's run the clock down instead of playing the game, you know. So you always have to play win. Uh, nothing is impossible. You know, uh, 
Another Star Wars reference. Ben Kenobi told Luke when Luke said, why do you tell me that Darth Vader was my father? He said, well, you know, the universe all depends on how you look at it. So if you look at the word impossible, everybody knows what this means. It can't be done, right? You look at it like that. One line. Now what does it say? I'm possible. Same word, same group of letters. It all depends on how you look at it. So the first one is address your fears up front. That's the first key to motivating yourself. Be honest about what you're afraid of. Be afraid of not ever having a job. I'll be honest, for me, it was the fear of living under a bridge. It was the fear of losing everything. You know, you got your house, you got your family, you, you know, you got your furniture, and it's like, I spent 20 years working for this, and the fear of losing it. And then, you know, one day you just say, you know what? If I lose it, I lose it. I got it, I'll get it again. It's only things. What's more important is my son being able to live and say, Dad, I'm proud of you. And my son didn't know I was unemployed. He was, he was in the seventh grade at the time. I didn't tell him. Why? What, what could he do? He had, he, he had school to worry about. So I didn't tell him. When I landed, I told him. And he asked me why I, I didn't tell him. There's nothing he could do about it. But when you realize what's important, it's whether you achieve or not, did you keep trying? That's what's really important. Okay. Somebody can say, um, and we'll get into goals in the next one. Somebody say, my goal is to make a million dollars. And like, oh, that's a real honorable goal. You're going to work hard. And then the next day they buy a lottery ticket and win. A million dollars. <laughs> well, that really wasn't hard. <laughs> you know, they, they, boom, they got it. Anyway, so number one is address your fear. Number two is have a goal and a plan. Have a goal and a plan. Herm Edwards, NFL coach, has a really good quote. He said, a goal without a plan is a wish. A goal without a plan is a wish. You can say, I want to get there. And then somebody says, well, how are you going to get there? Well, I don't know. But I want to get there. Uh, experiment that I uh, participated in once at a, at a job networking meeting. They said, if your goal is to Meet the president. How would you do it? I said, well, that's, you know, I don't know how. I said, well, think about it. Your goal is to meet the president of the United States. Start thinking about how you would get there. But first, you've got to have the goal. And then you can work your way back and say, OK, well, who might the president know? He might know congressmen, senators, and so on. OK, now, who might they know? They might know community leaders and so on. And next thing you know, in three or four steps, bam, you've met the president. You found a way to talk to this person, to this person, to this person, to this person. Remember that uh, Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon? For those of you too young to know who Kevin Bacon is, he's an actor who has been in a ton of movies. And there's this thing called seven, Six Degrees, not Seven Degrees, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. And it's the idea that if you pick any actor over the last hundred years, you can get to Kevin Bacon in six steps by going through directors, co-stars, other people that worked on the film, you can get to him in six steps. He's worked on that many movies. And I mean, they did it with, you know, Fatty Arbuckle in the 30s and was able to get to Kevin Bacon in six steps. But the thing is, you got the goal and then you have the plan. Having the goal, because you've heard people say, my goal is to do this. How are you going to do it? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. How are you going to do it? I don't know. But I got that goal in my head. But with out a plan, it's not really a goal, it's a wish. Um, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. People, uh, everybody knows the story of um, Alice in Wonderland. And Alice got to the crossroads and she asked the, uh, was the Cheshire cat she asked, um, which road do I take? The cat said, where you want to go? I said, I don't know. I said, well, it doesn't really matter, then does it? You know, one of the things, one of the, the false, falsities or, or the, the untruths, I would say, about a lot of people that are very successful, I look at Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg didn't plan to have 
a, a website with it that a billion people used. He can say it now, but that was not his plan. Steve Jobs, who I idolize, did not have the plan to make Apple the most valuable, uh, most valuable company on the planet. But they had a plan, and their plan let them take advantage when opportunity arose. For those of you who remember, uh, old enough to remember MySpace for Facebook, had MySpace not been such a mess, Facebook would not be what it is today. But they were in position ready for it. So that's what you got to do. You, you got your plan, but your plan, if you have a plan, then when opportunity knocks, you're ready for it. Okay? If you say, well, I'm going to make a million dollars by the time I'm 30, and somebody comes and offers you the opportunity to buy a lottery ticket, that might be a great winning lottery ticket, but because you don't have a plan on how to get there, you don't see it as an opportunity. You know what they say, opportunity, be, be ready when opportunity knocks? Be by the door when opportunity knocks. You never know when opportunity is going to knock. So always be prepared for it. And the way to be prepared for it is to have a plan. And work your plan. And if something happens to change your plan, fine. But at least have a plan. At least don't be sitting around waiting. You know, there's that, that drawing where there's a whole lot of stuff. And then there's like the, the result. And then there's two little people sitting there. And it's right here, the two lines don't meet. And one of them says, and in here it says, and a miracle occurs. That's their plan. They don't know how they're going to get there. Oh, a miracle occurs. And I says, we need a little bit more work right here. Don't count on a miracle. Count on hard work. If the miracle happens, great. Somebody comes up and gives you that lottery ticket, great. But don't count on it. So have your plan every day. If you're looking for a job, have something to do every day. I always tell people, um, because the first thing you do when you get in transition, you go out and you apply for every job you can find. You just apply math, 10, 15 jobs a day. I tell people, apply for one job a day, just one. But for every job you apply for, find two or three people in that company that you can talk to, that you can have a conversation with, either over the phone or have coffee with. If you do that, that's a full-time job. Finding somebody at every company. See, because when you go online and you know you go out and you apply for everything you see and you don't hear anything back or worse yet, you get all those rejections. It's the employment black hole where all the resumes go to die. You know? But instead of going wide, go deep. So have a plan. Say, okay, I want this, I want to get to this person. How do I get to this person? And then put their circle and keep and work your <coughs> way back to where you are. And that will give you your path to get there. Uh, number three, be intentional. You didn't land in transition by accident. You didn't get here. It was intentionally done for maybe a company downsized or whatever, but this was intentional. So you're not going to get out of transition by accident. You have to be intentional. Um, Margaret Thatcher had a, had, a, had a quote, and I'll paraphrase it. It said, uh, if I have to tell you I'm a lady, then I'm not. If you have to tell somebody, well, I'm, I'm very intentional about my job search, then you're not. It's like somebody saying, you know, they come and tell you they're a Christian. If you're a Christian, I should know it from your actions. I should see it in what you do. Okay? You might have blessed on the front of your car, but you might be giving somebody the finger because they cut you off. That's, that's reality. If you are intentional about your job search, everybody knows it. Everybody you meet knows it. Your friends know it. Your family knows it. The person you get in line with behind it, Publix, knows it. If you are intentional. You have to tell me you're intentional, and that's what a lot of people do. They brag about, I'm this, I'm that. If you have to tell me something about you, if I can't see it in your eyes, in your mannerism, in the way you carry yourself, then you're fooling yourself. As I say, uh, about having a plan and a goal, about being intentional. If you're not intentional about your job search, if you don't have a plan today for what you're doing, somebody else will be more than happy to make a plan for you. 
Number four is be persistent. My quote for this one is, a diamond ain't nothing but a piece of coal that's stuck with it. That's all it is. Stick with it. Muhammad Ali said, um, it isn't the mountains ahead of the climb that where you are. <coughs> it's the pebble in your shoe. It's the little things that stop you from being persistent. And being persistent does not mean every other day. If you have a dream, if you have a goal, you wake up and you see it every, every waking moment. And you do something toward it every chance you get. Muhammad Ali also said, don't count the days, but make the days count. Be persistent. When I was in transition, I used to go, and I still do for lunch, I go to Panera Bread. And I'm not giving them a commercial. They have free Wi-Fi, so I won't. But I would get up every morning. This is part of the reason my, my son didn't know I was unemployed. I would get up every morning, get dressed, and go to Panera Bread. And I would spend six to seven hours sitting in Panera Bread with my laptop every day, five days a week. And I would come home around 5 o'clock every day. Because if you stay at home, like I said, bunny slippers are evil. You try to do your job search at home, sometimes you have no choice. If you don't have a laptop, you have no choice. But even if you, if you only have a desktop, then get out of the house. But be persistent. I did my job search every day at Panera because I felt like my job was to find a job. So every day I got up and I went and sat. I knew all the waitresses, I knew everybody in there. And it was funny, after about two months, somebody came and asked me, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and I told them I was looking for a job. And you know, from that, you know, they, once they knew, they said, well, our HR person is going to be around tomorrow. Why don't you talk to her when she comes in? Mm -hmm. Nothing came of it, but you know, people know you're intentional. People <laughs> say, this guy is serious. He's here every morning. And I was there every day. And that's what being persistent is. It's not, okay, I'll go hang out there for a couple hours and I'll go home. You know, my job is to find a job, period. And everybody can see, could see that in me, or at least I hope they could see that in me, that I was trying to find a job. Number five is be perceptive. True story. There was a guy named Joshua Bell, who's a world famous violinist. He they did an experiment a couple of years ago where he went down to DC in the metro in the uh, subway system in DC. And he sat in the subway and played and some really intricate, some really, really well-written uh, song, written by Bach and Beethoven. He played them in the subway system, at, in the landing, for free. He just sat there and played them for a couple hours. They just want to see what would happen. People walked by, nobody really paid attention to him. A couple of days before, this guy had played a concert in D.C. Tickets were $100 a piece. Played the same songs. He had a $3.5 million violin he was playing on. He sat in the subway and played. People didn't recognize it. People didn't recognize that this was a world-class violinist because he wasn't in the right atmosphere. You know, these people, same people might have paid $100 to see him on stage, could stand there and listen to him for free, but it's not the right stage. You always got to be perceptive. One thing about hiring managers, you know, those are the holy grail for people in transition. Hiring managers go to Publix. They go to the grocery store. They go to church. They go to their children's softball games. Always be aware of what's around you. I tell you, I go to Panera Bread. I was going every day. I sat there one day, and there was a guy sat next to me for three hours. He was he had his laptop. He was doing some work. And we, you know, we didn't really talk. We were both in the middle of doing our own thing. And it just so happens we were both leaving about the same time, so we both started packing up. And we just started making small talk. This guy was a hiring manager of a Home Depot. He was in HR. I sat next to this guy for three hours. You never know. You never know. 
You could be in line behind somebody at Publix, and you get mad at the cashier and go off and just chew the person out for something minor, not knowing. You know, think about this: the person in front of you is the person you got to interview with the next day. And think about you don't know that you walk in and, and the first thing they think, oh, you were the person that chewed out and, and, and went off on the cashier last night at Publix. You're always on stage. Understand that you are always on stage. You are always, even when you land a job, when you're working, you are always on stage. Okay. When you decide to go out in public in something that is not as flattering as it should be, shall we say, people notice. And it's nothing like, again, you have an interview or you have coffee with somebody, you have an informational interview tomorrow with somebody, and today they saw you in some Daisy Duke shorts. Perception. You only get one chance to make a first impression. You're always on stage. So be perceptive of what's around you. Okay. Opportunity doesn't always knock. Sometimes it just stands there, waiting for somebody to take it. So be perceptive. Number six is be humble. You would think that being in transition would make you humble. You would be surprised how unhumble people are in transition. Uh, I was at a um, the Penn meeting, uh, which is the Department of Labor does once a month over way over in Toco Hills. Oh yeah. When I was in transition, I was putting 300 miles a week on my car, driving around to different meetings. Yeah. Um, but they had a mock interview session one night with us. They had a couple of the hiring the managers for the Department of Labor would interview everybody in the room. And then at the end of the session, they would give everybody feedback. And there was this one guy, and they gave him feedback. And he was an older gentleman. Maybe he was maybe, maybe 50. And they told him, you are the most arrogant person we ever met. And he just looked at me, and, and the, the person interviewing, that one of the people interviewed, because a couple of people interviewed, so you had a couple of different perspectives. The person interviewing him said, uh, you act like you know more than me. And he said, well, let's be honest. When I'm interviewing with somebody, I probably do know more than them. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> that may be true, but that dummy has a job. <laughs> you don't, okay? Um, be humble, and not just in transition. You know, it's, it's nice to be humble when you need help. But when you get up on top, all of a sudden, all that humble goes out the window. I read this today. It said, talent is God-given. Be humble. Fame is man-given. Be grateful. And conceit is self-given. Be careful. Be humble. Be humble. Be humble in everything you do. Your talents are not yours. God gave you their talents. Whether it's to play basketball or to write poetry, God gave you that talent. Yeah, maybe you studied or maybe you practiced and improved on it, but God gave you that talent. And God is the one who allowed you the time to practice. You know, we see athletes all the time. When they're on top, they're arrogant and, and nobody can tell them anything because they are the greatest thing in the world because of who they are. And then a couple of years later, when the talent's gone and they realize, you know, there's nothing. There was a, ESPN did this uh, special called, uh, was it Broke? I think his name was Broke and it talked about all these athletes who, when they were on top, they were spending their money like crazy. And, you know, because this is the crazy part. You think that, okay, I made this much money this year. I don't care if I have some kids out there that I got to pay for, so what? Not doing the math that I got to pay for this kid for 18 years, I'm not going to be playing football for 18 years. Do the math, okay? I'm going to be playing football for four, five, six years. This kid is here for 18. These eight kids are here for 18 years. 
But all of a sudden, you know, I, you probably saw Terrell Owens was on um, Dr. Phil crying, talking about he can't afford all his kids now. No, Terrell Owens, guy had great athletic ability. He was not humble at all when he was at the top of his game. So the thing is, you know, people say stuff like, the people you step on on the way up or the people you got to, rears you got to kiss on the way down. If you be humble, even if you are successful, be humble. Understand that God gave you this talent, whatever it is. If you always remember that, that and it's, again, not just in transition. In transition, it is more important because there is nothing like an arrogant person sitting across from me that I'm interviewing. And I'm thinking, do I want to work with this person? <coughs> they may have all the letters behind their name. They may have the experience and everything. Do I want to work with this person? Because you got to understand, getting through life is not just about your grades. It's about how you get along with people. There have been people who have gotten jobs that they were not qualified for because they got along with somebody. And, and the person interviewing them said, we can work with you. You know, I, I say job search, and I always bring this up. Job search is like dating. It is. It really is like you're, you're trying to make a love connection. And you'll see somebody, you ever see a a model, a supermodel, male or female, and you see their spouse and you go, that person's not in your league. But you know what? They said, I can get along with this person. When, when the chips are down, this person will have my back. This person is not going to be so concerned with themselves that they can't spend time with me. Be humble rest of your life. If you haven't been up to this point, be humble. I'm going to tell you now, nothing like losing your job to make you humble. The thing is, when you land back on your feet, don't forget what this was like. Don't, for, don't, don't start thinking, I did this. Nobody helped me. You know, people get mad when they're in transition because God isn't following their plan. And I say this, God has never followed your plan. Think about it. You had a plan and God had a plan. God's plan is what happened. So what did you do? You switched your plan to his plan and say, that was my plan. God has never followed your plan. There's always been somebody more powerful. So <coughs> that was number six. And finally, number seven. I'll review really quickly first. Address your fears. Have a goal. Be intentional. Be persistent. Be perceptive. Be humble. And finally, believe. Believe in what you want so much that it has no choice but to materialize in front of you. Believe that there is a power stronger than you that is in charge of all this. Because Transition does not make sense. I, worked, I was in the insurance industry for 20 years. My degree degree is in accounting. My master's is in finance. I give you all the credit in the world. I was not sitting for the CPA. There's no way in the world I'm sitting there. <laughs> I worked in insurance for 20 years. Came down to Atlanta. Everybody said, this is the insurance capital. It's like, well, I just left Connecticut. They said that was the insurance capital. But now they're saying it's Atlanta. OK, fine. When I was laid off in the insurance industry, I could find I spent a year trying to get back into the insurance industry. Could not get back into it. You know, and there was a little bit of anger. You know, I've given so much to this industry. I understand insurance. I I wasn't just a salesperson. I didn't do sales, but I was the back office people. I did everything. I did sales compensation. I did contracting. I did database marketing. I knew insurance. I did claims. I did. Uh, um, account management. I couldn't get back in. Could not get back in insurance. And I was mad about it. And there's a point where you say, okay, God, look, you got a plan for me. 
And when I accepted that, I mean, I'd already accepted God, but it was hard to accept that I wasn't going back into the only thing I knew. That was the fear of, I don't know anything else but insurance. I have to get back in insurance. I work in hospitality now, and I love it. My degrees are in finance and accounting. I do web analytics. It's about marketable skills and not accounting. That's what it is. If somebody would have told me I'd be working in the hospitality industry, I'd said, mm -hmm. never. Wasn't even on the radar. Was not even on the radar. What happened? When I was in transition, my goal was to try to help as many people as I can. I started doing these speeches. I started doing my podcast while I was still out of work. And my career coach thought I was crazy. Because I, I was fortunate. I had outplacement service. They thought I was crazy. They said, you're not looking for a job. You're playing around. I said, no, I'm looking for a job. But I'm trying to get through transition. But I felt this. If I help as many people as I can, somebody's going to help me. And guess what? Out of the blue one day, somebody who I had been in transition with, who had gotten back on their feet and got a job, called me up and said, I saw this job on our postings. I thought you would be good for it. Out of the blue. Said, I want to say, send me your resume. My resume. Day later, I get a call from somebody. Hey, come on and talk to us. Totally different industry. You never know when opportunity is going to knock. And I say, you're always on stage. That's my story. I'm in my mid-40s. I changed industries. The thing everybody said you can't do, I did it. I didn't plan to do it, but God came for me and had it done. <coughs> That's what happened. So you got to believe. No matter what, you got to believe in something. Somebody gave me, when I, when I landed, somebody gave me, and I have this, this plaque on my desk now. It says, believe when it's beyond reason to believe. You know, what is it? It's Hebrews 1.11 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. You hear people say, I'd rather walk with God in the dark than myself in the light. you got to believe. You got to believe. If you didn't have faith, when you don't have faith, when you don't believe that, that God has your best intentions in, in mind, you're out there swinging and you don't know what's going on. That's when you get hopeless. You know. God has a plan for you. Everything happens for a reason. I didn't know what the reason was. But look at me now. I, I am doing things I never expected to be doing. If somebody would have told me four years ago, I'd be doing a weekly podcast, I would have said you're crazy. Why? But God let me there. I was going to give a speech and somebody, uh, who was uh, a friend of mine, had a, a career coach friend, they talked to me, we were talking, and they said, why don't you do a podcast? Why? And he said, because you got a message. I've been doing that podcast now over two years. If somebody would have told me that I would have something to talk about every week for over two years, I would have said, you're crazy. So what did it? God brought people to me. So now I interview authors. I interview career coaches. I interview um, Mark Tidwell. This man has terminal cancer. You think you got problems? He's got terminal cancer. He's done. He goes around and gives motivational speeches. Put stuff in perspective for you. Okay. He says, he has, he, he has a t-shirt that says, I'm terminal, and so are you. One of the most inspirational stories I've ever heard, talking to this man who's dying and knows he's dying. Wife and three daughters. Okay. It puts stuff in perspective. You know. Yeah, okay, I gotta find a job. This man is dying. His family knows it. You want to talk about perspective? That's perspective. So believe. I say, you know, when your phone hasn't rung in a while, you've got to believe. When you're applying for 10 jobs a day and you get 10 rejections, you've got to believe. When you haven't had an interview in months, 
you got to believe. When your car starts making those funny noises and you start praying, oh Lord, what is it? You got to believe. And everything you do, believe. If you do that, if you just believe, I'm not saying if you say, God, I believe, and tomorrow you're going to have a job. I'm not saying that's going to happen, because that may not be God's plan for you. But if you believe and say, God, handle it. You just say, God, look, do it. I'm going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do, and let you handle it. And that's what I did. I went to Panera every day. And I'm telling you, I was there seven hours a day. Okay? A day, because, well, they got bottomless sweet tea. But that's a whole other issue. Yeah, I put some pounds on with that stuff. But if you believe, yeah, and I told my son, you got to go to school every day. You got to be in there six hours a day. You can come out dumb, or you can come out smart. If you're going to be there, you might as well get something out of it. You're going to go through transition until it's over. You're going to land your job when you land it. <coughs> the question becomes, when you look back on the time you spent in transition, will you be proud of how you spent this time? Will you have become a better person? You know, what, does it say? what does it kill you make you stronger? Sometimes you wish it would kill you. <laughs> but life to me, when I look back on my life, when I'm in my, whenever I retire, if I ever do get a chance to retire, and I look back on my life, I may not have achieved everything that I wanted to. But am I proud of what I did? I'm not saying I'll have a bunch of accolades. But will I be proud of what I did with my life? Did I try to help somebody? Did I try to corrupt somebody? When you look back on this time, on transition, because a lot of people want to look back on it and they want to forget about it like it never happened. When you look back on this time, were you a better person when it ended than when it began? you got to believe. No matter what, if you just say, okay, God, I'm giving it to you. Maybe I wasn't meant to have this house. Fine, take it. It's only material things. But you have to believe. So, that was number seven. I want to thank you for indulging me, for listening. Um, I hope that something I said makes your journey smoother. And not just your journey in transition, your journey of life. That, if I can do anything to help you, again, website, bunnyslippersareevil.com. Podcast is there. You can listen to two years worth of podcasts, all free. You can subscribe to it in iTunes. Follow me on Twitter, at Evil Bunny Man. I tweet jobs. All free. I'm a big proponent of free. Okay? If it's free, I'm there. Okay? I did a show on coupons. How to use coupons. Somebody said, that's got nothing to do with transition. I said, that's got everything to do with transition. I said, because when you're in transition, you don't have any money. And you'd be surprised how many people, I don't have the time to do, 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 do coupons. Really? <laughs> huh? Okay. Don't. Because the fewer people do it, the better the coupons are. But I did a show on, trans on coupons because that's part of transition. Okay. This week's show is called Unleash the Greatness Within. Okay. 10 o'clock Saturday morning. If you can't listen to it live, you can call in and listen to it. Or <coughs> wait till after and listen to it on the website. It's free. That, I thank you all for your time. Um, Again, if I can do anything to help you, please let me know. Thank you for coming to God's Employment Network. Um, I can tell you from experience. This makes you feel good when you leave. Thank you.